kind of excited about today's message. It's a great message. We've come to Genesis chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles on the side. If you'll raise your hand, somebody will grab you a Bible and get a Bible into your hand because we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter through here. It says in chapter 18 of Genesis, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham by the Tiberneth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent, in the door of his tent, in the heat of the day. It's siesta time. You know, it's hot in the Middle East and they... they, they Look for that shaded place, that cool place, to just kick back for a few hours and let the heat pass and you know, all of that stuff. And this is an appearing of God to Abraham. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ before his incarnation appearing to Abraham because that's the only way God appears in human flesh is through Jesus Christ. He's by the Tiburon's trees of Mamre. This, this is apparently his favorite place in the whole land to live. It's a desert. And he, he's going to buy a, a cave there, Cave of Machpelah. He's going to bury his wives there. He's going to bury himself there. He, his sons are going to be buried. You know, it, it becomes an important place. But it's hot. Nobody travels during this hot time, right? Everybody's checking out in some trees or hiding somewhere. And it says, So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet and bowed himself down to the ground. He looks up. I don't know if he's been sleeping, napping. I don't know. He's just sitting there and trying to get a little breeze, trying to get a little coolness. And it, in the Hebrew, it has this suddenness to it. Suddenly, three guys are right there. Now, he's in the desert. You can see for miles in the desert, every direction. These guys didn't just sneak up, you know. It's like they just appeared there. He's 99 years old. And he sees these three guys, and he leaps up, and he runs to them. Does that sound like you? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm all about that, you know. And he bows himself before them. Now, understand this. He is a what would be considered a wealthy sheik. He's very wealthy. He's aged, you know. He runs. He bows. How do we rise to meet the Lord every day? <laughs> is it like that? Your alarm goes off and you're up, you know. Woo! Here we go. I can't wait to get on my knees and worship the Lord. I can't wait to, you know, read my Bible. I can't wait. You, you rise up like that? Because me, it's like the, oh, it's the alarm. Oh, no. Snooze. Snooze some more. Where's the really, where's the, where's the supersized snooze on your phone? Where is that, you know? Are we exciting? Are we excited to meet him? To meet with him? My, it's a great question. So verse 3, and he says, My Lord, interesting, Master, King, however you want to look at that. If I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. But please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. He looks up, he sees these three guys and hospitality immediately comes into his heart. Now if you've ever been in the Middle East, hospitality is everything back there. And he goes, man, won't you guys just stick around for a while, hang out for a while. Let me get you some water to wash off your feet. If they just appeared, they don't need to wash their feet off, you know. Interesting. Let me, let me get you a seat under these trees so you're out of the sun. Let me bring you some bread. And what that means is bring you a meal. Let me, let me serve you. Let me take care of you. Allow me to refresh your hearts. And, and they say, well, okay, let's do that. Man, I have so many questions here. Does he know who they are? You know, we know the Lord has appeared to him before. Has he always appeared in the same form? Does he recognize him? Does he know him? You know, is there that, that kind of intimacy? I don't know, but he knows something's up. Abraham is being prodigal in his treating of these men. Prodigal means lavish. Prodigal means, you know generous 
And he's going to be prodigal. Because why? Because the Lord has already been prodigal to him. We love him because he first loved us. Right? So verse 6. And Abraham hurried. Notice that. Here's this old guy just running around the camp, you know. He hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran out to the herd and took a young and tender good calf and gave it to a young man and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which were prepared and set before them and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. He does everything with speed. Everything's in a hurry. Sarah, quick, take the finest of your stuff. Don't take the last night's leftovers, you know. Don't give them leftover Johnny Carinos, you know. Don't do that. Let's do something right, you know. And he runs out to the herd, picks the best little lamb or, or calf or whatever it is, you know. He does all of that for these unexpected guests. You know, Colossians 3 says, do whatever you do heartily as unto the Lord whatever you're doing whoever you're serving notice verse 8 and he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them and stood by them as they ate under the tree he serves them here's this wealthy guy he has servants but he serves them he serves them I, I love that and he serves them generously. He serves them the absolute best that he has. But he involves other people in that service. He's not afraid to ask Sarah to help. He's not afraid to ask that young lad to help. He's not afraid to get them involved in serving the Lord. I like that. And notice, then he just stands by them as they eat. Like a waiter would. Need anything else? Needs more of that? Pass the butter, you know. Can you imagine that the Lord and two angels sitting? Because that's who we know they are. They're sitting there, and there's, hey, hey, uh, Gabriel, will you pass the salt? You know, hey, uh, I need a little of this. You, I, I just, it blows my mind that it would be so real, right? God didn't need to eat. The angels don't need to eat. But because it was in Abraham's heart, they receive it. I love that picture, you know. Because they want to fellowship with Abram. Not necessarily eat, but hey, if that's fellowship, let's fellowship, you know. Hebrews 13, you guys all know it. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. What is our heart for serving? For serving the Lord, for serving others. Are we waiting until it's convenient? Man, if it wasn't so hot today, I could do it. If it wasn't so cold outside, I might do that, you know? If, if it was a little earlier or a little later or if it was just according to, you know, when I felt like it. Abraham is the kind of man who when he sees the opportunity, he jumps in, he serves. He meets that opportunity he jumps at the chance to serve and he doesn't scrimp when he does it he gives his best he doesn't mind getting others involved in his service to do it you know hospitality is an important part of the christian faith and we have lost that <laughs> we have lost that when's the last time you invited somebody over the house When's the last time? You know? We're going to be entertaining strangers. Hospitality. Romans 12, 13. We're to be distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. It's supposed to be something that we're given to. 1 Peter 4, 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. That's not hospitality. <laughs> He's eating all my stuff. He took the best potato chips, you know. So. By lovingly serving, we serve Christ, no matter who you're serving. 
And we promote the spread of the gospel because they see that. You know, Brenda and I have had an opportunity to invite some interesting people into our house. <laughs> and it's been a growing experience. We've met some very interesting people. But we are richer for it. Yeah, it's a step of faith. <sighs> They're going to come into my house. They have access to everything. What if they do? <laughs> you know? Yeah, but growing in faith is good, right? So verse 9, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? Boy, a big kicker there. She was just renamed in the last three months. Well, maybe less than three months. We know it's been less than three months because God at the time when he renamed Sarah says, at this time next year you're going to have a child. She's not pregnant yet. Take nine months off of 12 months. Of, yeah, we know it's in the, the same three month period that's going on here. Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, oh, here in the tent. You know, there's a separation between men's business and, and women's business thing. And verse 10 gives it away. And he said, I will certainly, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent of the door which was behind him. <laughs> I will come. And it's clear who's talking now. Oh, this is the Lord. This is the Lord. Come down. Who are these other two? Don't have a clue, right? But we know the Lord. I'm going to come back according to the measure of life, according to the time of life. I don't really know what that means. But behold, he uses that word behold. And every time you see that word behold, you need to stop and think and consider carefully what follows. Sarah, your wife, she's going to have a son. She's going to have a child. Not some stand-in. Not another Hagar, Sarah, you know. Now, this is not the first time they've been told that. But don't you love it when the Lord reminds you of something he's already told you? Because he has to remind me over and over and over. Mark, I'll never leave you. I'll never for sure. Are you sure? Because it feels like I'm all alone. I'll never leave, you know. He does that to me all the time. Because we have a way of forgetting things. We have a way of taking something that God said directly to you and then spiritualizing it. Well, I think he was just giving us a spiritual picture of what might happen. No, oh, he was telling you what's going to happen. Not some spiritual picture of it. So he reminds them both again of this fact. I am going to do this miracle between you and your wife. Verse 11 now, Abraham and Sarah were old. Boy, I'm glad they put that in there, aren't you? I mean, man, they probably needed reminding, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're old. Well advanced in age. I like it in the King James. Stricken in years, you know? <laughs> I used to think people that were 50 were stricken in years, you know? Now, now I've got a little more wisdom than that. But I remember being a kid and looking at people that were like 50, and man, you were as old as dirt. How are you still functioning? How do you still move? Not very easily, as I can, I can tell you now. Well past the age of childbearing. Did you get that? She's gone through the change. She's gone through menopause. She's not functioning that way any longer. That's a physical impossibility now. That's, that's where he's taking them to. The physical impossibility of this. Therefore, verse 12, what's the therefore, therefore? I've taught you this, right? Every time you see a therefore, what's it there for? Because it's either concluding something or about to reveal something that we've been talking about. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have the pleasure, have this pleasure, my Lord, being old also? Sarah has been listening at the tent of the door at the door of the tent. Can you see her back there? You know, all the guys are out there, and she's got her glass up. 
on the screen door, you know, she's listening as good as she can. And she's listening to all this stuff. Oh, I'm going to return again. And Sarah, your wife, she's going to have a child. And verse 11, I think, is inside Sarah's mind. <sighs> How's that going to happen? I'm old. I've gone through the change. My husband's old. How is all this stuff going to happen? It's, it's, it's impossible. And she laughs. Notice this, not out loud. She laughs within herself. <laughs> you ever do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're as old as the hills. There's not a chance in the world that that's ever going to happen. We need to take note of something here. Because we always seem to think that it's harder for God to do some things than it is for him to do other things. Right? I've got cancer. And so, oh, we've got cancer. And it's all, oh, you know, and we think that's this huge thing. And somebody else is over here, and I got a migraine. I got a headache. And you're thinking, well, we better pray for this guy and forget that guy because, you know. Do you realize it takes no more faith to fix this one than that one? Do you realize that God is creator of the heavens and the earth. He is all powerful. And this one is just as simple as that one. But, you know, we think, you know, I, I got to really pray about this one. I got to bring in the big words. You know, I got to spend, you know, 30 minutes on my knees instead of two minutes on my knees. You know, I got... That's so foolish. It's so foolish. Our omnipotent God is not staggered by the task that needs to be done. Our faith is, not him. Anytime we doubt God, which is what Sarah's doing here, we question his veracity and his ability. Does he really keep his promises? That runs through our minds. Is he able to do what he's told me he's going to do? Those run through my mind. Abe had laughed. Abraham had laughed in the last chapter. God had told him what was going to happen, and he laughs. He laughs in joy. He laughs. Woohoo! I'm going to get a son, and it's going to be our family, and I'm going to have some downline, and it's going to be for my wife. And, you know, he laughs about that in faith, believing. Romans 4.18 Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old. 99 is about 100 years old, you know. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now understand this. Sarah's womb has been dead her whole life. She's never had a child. Never been able to have a child. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what God has promised, he was also able to perform. Man, that is where we're supposed to stand. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. So, verse 13. And the Lord said to Abram, I was questioning this, why is he talking to Abram about this? And the Lord said to Abram, why did Sarah laugh? Ask her. Oh, Abe, you're in charge of your household and you're in charge of your household's faith. Do you understand that, men? How are we doing on that? That's our responsibility. This is our playground. We're supposed to be doing that. She, why did she laugh saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now understand this. That word hard, it means hard. But in the Hebrew, it also has another meaning. You may have read Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That word wonderful in there, is the same word as hard. 
So here in the Hebrew it says, wonderful. Is anything too wonderful for God? Or it says hard. Is anything too hard for God? And I love that because the hard things in life are the wonderful things in life. And the wonderful things in life are the hard things in life. When God makes you a promise, we can be sure that he has the power to fulfill it and he has the will to fulfill it. Even if we become faithless in the midst of it like Sarah does here. You know, if we are faithful, he remains faithful for he can't deny himself. Second Timothy tells us. So verse 15, Sarah hears God talking about her to her but Sarah denied it. <laughs> you got to get this picture. Abraham and the guys are out in front of the tent somewhere. Sarah's inside the tent. And up to this point has been absolutely silent from the tent. And God says, Abraham, why did your wife just laugh? Why did Sarah laugh in unbelief? And you hear from the tent, I didn't laugh. <laughs> that makes me laugh. The working of God among us sinners just cracks me up. Here she is, trying to tell the Lord that she hadn't laughed. You, you, you didn't hear me laugh. I, I really didn't laugh. It, it was a little white laugh, you know. What was she trying to do there? God knows our thoughts. He even knows the intents of our hearts. You don't think he knew he laughed, you know. Now, what, what gets me about this is, the Lord should have just drawn a line, right? If, he, if the Lord worked the way you and I worked, okay, it's done. I'm done working with you two. I'm going to go find a couple that actually have faith, that actually want to walk with me, that actually want to believe that I can do what I'm going to do. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. He sticks right in there. Because God is long-suffering, merciful, gracious. He's kind. He reminds her, oh, Sarah, oh, you did laugh. Do you see that there? But oh, Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, God said back, no, but you did laugh. Here Sarah is an unbelief. She's lying to God, to his face. And he doesn't just smoke her. <clears throat> I'll get you a new wife, Abram. You know? He, he doesn't... Just give her a plague, you know. Suddenly you're a leper and it's over, you know. No, God is tender and loving and gracious and kind. She will repent of this unbelief. And God will visit them in a couple of months. And a child will be born to them. Ishmael, or Isaac. Allowing them to do that through a natural the two becoming one flesh act. Supernatural, because they're both, they're, both their bodies are as good as dead. So in chapter 18, we see Abraham as a man who trusts God and serves him with everything that he has. Also coming to understand, I need to strengthen the faith of my household. This is a man of God's influence. He ends up being a blessing to the whole world. All nations will be blessed through this guy. But in contrast to that, next week we're going to look at Lot, who has no godly influence in his town, in his family, even in his wife. So verse 16. Then these men rose from there, and look towards Sodom. I wonder what that look was like. And Abraham went with them to send them on their way. That's what hospitality does. Walks you back out, gets you on the road again. So the party breaks up. These guys are on assignment. They're headed somewhere. And they seem to be checking out Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that cities of the plain. And Abe walks with them. And the Lord said... 
Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord and do righteousness and justice, and that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. This, these verses are not here so we can, we can go, well, God's questioning himself, what he's doing there. No, it's to let us know what God is thinking when he involves Abraham in this discussion. We can see God's purpose why he does what he does when we read these verses. For I have known him. And that is a tremendous statement. God knows Abraham intimately, completely. It's like he's saying, I've chosen him. He is my intimate friend. I love him. I'm going to involve him in my work and in my doing. And I've done that because he is going to teach his children right and wrong, good and evil. Do you love the Lord? Does he know you like this? What's our calling? What's the calling upon your life? First and foremost, it's your family, right? You got any downline, that's your first missionary journey. <laughs> making sure your kids know. Making sure your grandkids know. Making sure your wife is strong in the faith. Making sure your husband is strong in the faith. That's, that's our, our place, you know? And then our household. Everybody in the house, you know? We're to train up a child in the way he should go. We all know that. Deuteronomy 6 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. When you, you should bind them as signs on your hands and on the frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on the gates. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever's going on, God should be involved in that. You should be able to say, well, the Lord taught me how to do this and he, he showed me this inside and the Lord does this. And We don't do that very much. I love those times when we do it. And we should be able to teach them to do rightly, to act justly, and to walk humbly with their God and to be in obedience to Him. So the Lord doesn't give Abraham this information just to give him a big head. He's the smartest guy. Has nothing to do with that. He gives Abraham this information so he will pass it on to the next generation and they will know rightly how to judge and what God does and what God doesn't do. You know, if you're a man or woman of God, <clears throat> you need to learn to share what God has given you, what God is telling you, what God has given you, what God has lent you. You need to understand, you need to give that stuff away because the more you give that away, the more you get. And we, as Christians, don't necessarily give to get, but it's not a bad habit as far as information and learning and knowledge and wisdom and faith go. God shares openly with those who share with others. So God takes this moment to explain to Abraham, no, I will not destroy the wicked with the righteous. That's the whole point of the discussion that's coming up. So verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and, has be and their sin become very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that is against it, that has come up to me, and if not, I will know. Abraham standing here in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord begins to speak to him. This is what I'm doing in your world. I'm going to go over and check out. Because if the blood of Abel cries out from the, blo uh, cries out from the ground, you remember that in Genesis? If the blood of Abel cries out, how, what kind of cry is coming from Sodom and Gomorrah? 
What kind of cry is reaching to the heavens to God? Think about the innocent lives there. Think about the young and the old that are being abused. Think about the ones who just happenly, happenstance wandered into that city and were abused, as we're going to find out that these two angels are going to try to be abused. Imagine the godly who were praying for that city and for those people all those years. What kind of cry went up to God? Because their sin was great. Now think about that. We think about Sodom and Gomorrah as only having one kind of sin. Ooh, it was that sin and we don't want to talk about it. Sodomy, Sodomites, you know. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, they get this reputation. But in order to get to that point, they went through many other sins. And that's something you need to figure out. Sure enough, if you close your eyes to God, God, I don't want to hear your word. And God, I don't want to see your design, your handiwork in creation. Then you're destined to go wrong. You're destined to, to drive off course. You know, you ever tried that? I don't want to look at road signs anymore. I'm just going to drive. Uh, good luck with the ditch bank, you know? It's coming. It's coming your way really rapidly, right? Here's the trouble with Sodom and Gomorrah. They had closed their eyes to design. They had closed their eyes to nature. They had shut God out of the picture. And they wanted right and wrong according to their standard. And when you do that, a culture, a society, can no longer think rationally. Now stick with me here. It's wrong to kill a person. We call it murder. And it's inside everybody's heart. We know that's true. Unless that child is inside a mother's womb. And then we wink at it. Well, it's probably okay there. Is that rational? The safest place for a human being should be in the womb of its mother. Hey, let's, I got an idea. Let's defund the police and let's back all the looters and the rioters and the, the people like that. Is that rational thinking? Hmm. So once a culture is able to see the sexual act between a man and a man or a woman and a woman as natural that culture that society has lost its ability to discern truth period there's no logic there's no truth there's no design anymore You ever seen these things? You realize they were designed, right? They're designed. They have a function. They fit together like this. And when, when they fit together like that, they form a union, right? But this doesn't fit together. Not made for each other. This not, not made for each other. And we heterosexuals, we can look at this and go, see, I knew that other was wrong, but this is right. And we get our high moral plane and we go, yep, this is the way it's designed to be, and so this is good. You know what the problem with that is? This has one function. Inside of marriage, to lock two people together as one. And that is the function of this. But we use it everywhere. Oh, it's the right thing to do, so we do it over here, and we do it over there, and we do it back there, and up here, and over there. And it's great! God created it this way, and He did, but He created it to hold together, not outside of the marriage union, inside of the marriage union. A child knows how simple this is. 
and how easy that fits and functions and works. Do we have any right for a high moral plane? No. No, we don't. Paul in Romans tells us, you know, he walks through Romans chapter 1, he says, I reveal myself inside of you, inside the way you're created, you're made, because of the design, the creation. I mean, just imagine what it took to build this. It's not happenstance. You know, it's not some ooh to the goo to the zoo to you kind of process. No, no, no. This is design. And it's, he's manifest in the creation. We see design. We see reason. We see beauty. We see logic. We see all of this stuff in creation. And that should tell us there's a designer, there's an engineer, there's a painter, there's an artist, there's a... And that creator is greater than his creation. <laughs> but because we refuse to see him, let's, let's, just, let's just throw him aside and let's just live our lives the way we want to live them. We can't do that because you were designed to worship. And if you refuse to worship God, guess what you're going to worship? Romans chapter 1 tells us again, first thing we're going to worship is the creation instead of the creator. So we get tree huggers. Oh, I love the green and the trees and the nature and Mother Earth and eh, we should all do this. And we get the rest of us who learn to worship, ooh, man, that guy is hot. Ooh, that girl is built like, you know. And what do we worship? The creation rather than the creator. We lust after them begins to fill our hearts with desire. And then we do what we do outside of the bonds of marriage, and we are guilty, guilty, guilty. Just as guilty. Then we allow others who are twisted in different ways. It talks about iniquity in these verses, that, that iniquity, that inward twistedness that you came out of the factory with. And they begin to explore, you know, other possibilities, men with men and women with women and, you know, all of that stuff. And we have no moral standing to point at them and say that's wrong because we lost our moral standing over here when we thought this was right anywhere. It's not. And as you go through Romans chapter 1, it says God gave them over to uncleanness. Yuckiness. He gave them over to vile passions. He gave them over to a debased mind. Think about that. A debased mind means a, a mind without a base, without a platform, without somewhere to stand. <laughs> Has no moral rudder, right? So we begin to look at things and we call it, well, it's love. It's just love. It's cool. Don't you be judging people. They're just in love. As long as it's two consenting adults and, you know, we go through all of that stuff. And then, then we get to that place where, where they go, well, I was born that way. I was born that way. Well, let's look at that for a minute. Romans chapter 1, verse 32, it says, Knowing this, that the righteous judgment of God, that, that knowing, they knowing, everybody's wired this way, everybody knows that the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, that those who practice such things, you know, are deserving of judgment. Not only do the same kind of things, but they approve those who practice them. 
That's where the twisted mind comes in, the debased mind. So Sodom's sin designation is deserved, but it all started with other sins. You go back to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, and it says this. Look, this was the iniquity, notice that word, this was the iniquity, this was the inward twist of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. The first thing he mentions is iniquity, uh, this inward twistedness. You've got it. Don't tell me you don't. You hear God say, hey, don't do that, and you're like, no, I don't want to. You know? That's that inward twistedness. We all have it. And we're all twisted in all kinds of ways. I came out of a factory a lying, thieving pervert. Just so you know. Came right out of the factory that way. Iniquity. So I was born that way. Okay. Well, here's the truth. We all come out of the factory that way. You may be twisted one way. I may be twisted another. I got this bent. You got that bent. Whatever it is. We all are sinners from our mother's womb. That's why God comes and says, repent. Repent first words out of his mouth. What was the first words Jesus ever said? Repent. <laughs> Change your mind. Get this thing straightened out. Because you're a little twisted right now. You need to get that back on track. He says to the thief, stop stealing. He says to the adulterer, stop adultering. He says to the liar, stop Lying. He says to the proud, stop being proud. He says to the hypocrite, stop being a hypocrite. Stop wearing a mask. He says to the murderer, stop murdering. He says to the drunk, stop being a drunk. Isn't that interesting? So the idea that we're born twisted, welcome to the human race. You've come this far. That's cool. Let's, let's keep going now. But Jesus died for your sins. Jesus came that if you would receive him, he would transform your life and make you not twisted anymore. He would set you right, set you free. But if we accept that idea that we're all born sinners and we should just accept the sin, wouldn't we have to open all the prison doors and let everybody out? Because all they did was walk out some inward twistedness in them. Sorry, I can't do that. So next it talks about pride. Oh man, I just think about our gay pride parades today. What a perfect name for it. Gay pride parade. How come we don't have, you know, thief day? National Thief Day. Let's celebrate everybody that's ever ripped anybody off. Let's do that today. You know? You're going to show up and just, woohoo, get them. Yeah. How, how about National Murderer Day? Child Abuser Day. Let's throw a big party. Everybody come and celebrate. God hates the proud because it shows that they've already hardened their heart to him and to others. I do not want to know that I'm wrong. I want to live in my own little world and I don't need anybody telling me how to live. They have fullness of food. Boy, America, don't listen to these next couple of things. They didn't need to work hard. They didn't need to stay busy. You know, most cultures of the world can I just say this out loud? Most of the cultures in the world work six days a week just to feed their families. We don't have that issue. Just to put bread on the table. They had abundance of idleness. I'm bored. Never heard that. Never ever heard that. And bored people, you know, idle hands are the devil's playground, right? I mean, they're doing all kinds of weird things because they're just bored. Neither did they help. There was opportunity for them to do good and they refused to do good. They wanted to do evil. 
you know, John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. The Lord here says their sin is very grave. Later he's going to call it an abomination, something that is much hated. Because they're not just sinning against God, they're sinning against nature. They're sinning against creation. They're, they're sinning against everything that is right there in front of them telling them that's wrong. And they still do it. There's this picture buried in here that it was the sin of Sodom that brought God down and ultimately led to their judgment. And it will be the sin of this world God down and leads to its judgment in the near future. You know, God's going to sweep up his bride and then send the angels in. And where do you get the idea that the believers are out first and then judgment falls? <clears throat> let's, let's read chapter 19, shall we? We'll, we'll get there next week. What happens in Sodom? The angels come. We can't do anything until you believers are out of here. There were only four believers in Sodom and Gomorrah. Only four. I think there's more than that here in Rexburg. You know, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness, but as long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God says in Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of those who die. I have no pleasure in that. Therefore, turn and live. Therefore, repent, that's that word, and live. So before God brings judgment on Sodom, before God's going to bring judgment on America, before God's going to bring judgment on this Christ-rejecting world, he's going to come down and check it out. He's not going to take your word for it. See, Christ is a good carpenter, right? A good carpenter measures twice and cuts once. A good carpenter measures, makes sure it's right, and then cuts. And that's what God is going to do. He's going to measure us. How are you on the measuring line? How are you in this dimension? Are we self-righteous well at least I do it the way it's designed still sin still evil it's still absolutely wrong and by you doing it that way you've allowed the other ones to come in and do it that way what about in Europe Europe the great Europe that we all should model after you know who's given up on the Lord given up on churches closed everything down and now they lower the age of consent between an adult and a child to 12 years old, 13 years old. Is that right? Well, that's love. Does a 12 year old know what love is? Did you at 12? How do we say no to that? Well, I already said it's okay to do there. It's okay for this. It's okay for this. It's okay for this. It's okay for this. What kind of ground are we standing on? We have no ground whatsoever. That's why we've got to come back to this. This is the ground we can stand on. God is the one who wrote, this is right and this is wrong, and we must shuck off everything the world is telling us and come back to absolute truth and find our standing there. Because there and only there can you say right and wrong, but you can't do it in judgment. That's God's job. We do it in love. How do you do it in love? You look at them and you say, I see what you're mixed up in. 
you know, I used to be mixed up in all kinds of all kinds of stuff. Let me tell you where I came from. Blah 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 blah. But God, but God, took pity on me, and He sent His only begotten Son to die for my sins, and He died for your sins. And if you're willing today, He will receive you to Himself. And he will wash you clean, white as snow. All of those sins will be cast away like they never, ever happened. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. That could be yours today if you'll open your heart. Not if you'll open your mind. Not if you'll change your ways. If you'll open your heart to him. Oh, Father, how we need this lesson. Lord, it's not enough to stand in a self-righteous position and say, well, at least I've got design on my side. At least I've got this on my side. No, if we don't have God on our side, we have nothing on our side. Lord, would you give us the wisdom to know that we must cry out to you. That we must accept you and receive you. You're our only hope in this fallen world that just grows worse and worse and worse from generation to generation. And that just makes your salvation greater and greater and greater, more of a miracle when you pull people out of this darkness and into your marvelous light. Lord, I pray for any who are caught up in sin. It doesn't have to be sexual sin. But even if it's sexual sin, even if it's abomination, even if they've said no, 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 no a thousand times, God, that you would draw them and speak to their hearts. Awaken them. Not only to your truth, but reveal yourself to them, to your love. You know, sin isn't bad because it's banned. Because, you know, but sin is banned because it's bad. It's evil. It, it hurts. It destroys. Lord, right, let us get that into our lives. Lord, work among your people. And Lord, work out there in the world among the lost sheep. Lord, draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.